in there next to that one that one there you yeah. go now yeah. i'm safe there you go it's slipping on my face yeah <laughs> Yeah, and it's funny because if you put your hand in front of your face, it can't tell where your face is anymore, and it'll sort of <laughs> move around. <laughs> yeah, but again, those things a little goes a very long way. <laughs> it it reminds me when I got in. You you probably remember Ed Des, uh, Ventura Publisher. Oh yeah, he, I was APCU's newsletter editor for some for years, and. The first thing when you get something like that, you start making stuff that looks like ransom notes because you've got the ability, you've got all those fonts and everything else, and you got to play with them. And then you finally learn that less is more. Yes. And, and these filter kind of things are the same thing. You get it, you play with all the stuff, and then you realize less is more. Yeah, I've been, I test the apps before I turn them loose on other people. Like, I had to, uh, my wife thinks she's got to download the Live Well app for Advocate to sign up for COVID. And I said, and I, lo I loaded the app down on my phone and said, this is extremely lame. It assumes a lot, nothing, and it doesn't know how to link to your existing doctor who might be an Advocate doctor already and should be able to pull the information from, but there's no way to set anything like, who's my doctor? Here's my doctor. Go get the information from him. So you're not bugging me about half a dozen shots I already have and I'm up to date on. So, I was amazed with uh, DuPage Medical. I got an email and then I got a second email that said, okay, you can sign up for your COVID shot and going into Epic and uh, it was just so nice. You could select the time and everything that you wanted to go, and uh, it just wow. worked out real well. And then when after a sh after the shot, I got home and I signed back into Epic and uh, or my chart and set up the time. You know, they set up the date, and I selected the time that I want to go again. And it was just so easy. I have uh, I have your page medical, but I never got an email. My wife hasn't either yet. A lot depends. I'm a little more serious uh, up in the line where I've got a lot of medical conditions. And you are current. Doesn't. You're a current patient that you just had something done recently, so that's why they, <laughs> they triggered you. Yeah, that could be too. So, I um, know that um, my wife had her hip surgery done, so she's got an invite to go get hers. But I have I haven't even got a you know time of day from uh, the uh, Lake County Vax site, yeah. all Vax. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I've been uh, waiting. I tried to sign on to Advocate and said reestablish my connection, even though, hey, you know I had my shoulder done there. <laughs> a lot of work done as an outpatient. You think you might remember me? No yeah. one will remember you. Yeah, I, if they did remember you, they may not want to send it to you. So. Why I paid good. No, never mind. Well, I don't remember which hospital it was. They got in trouble because they sent out to their don their big donor list. Yeah. Um, and they apologized afterward, but they had actually sent out to their big donor list first. Wow. Well, Always easy to apologize afterwards. Yeah, really. <laughs> okay, we have open forum. So if you have a question that's just burning to be asked here's your big chance burning to be, well no questions wow i i saw some um, well i mean some computers are being sold with a combo ssd drive and a hard drive good choice when those come, do they auto, are they automatically labeled like C and D or what? Yes. It depends on yes. how they're installed, and you can change that around if you really want to. Okay. Usually, it, it's physical order on where it finds stuff, and both of those things are going to be uh, plugged into the motherboard, either on a SATA connection or an M2 connection. Depends on what kind of machine you're looking at and how new it is. But typically... Uh you want to install your operating system on the SSD, and then you can put your file, your file storage on the spinning hard drive, because most of the files that you manipulate, you're not doing it all the time every day, and it's an occasional use. It doesn't need to be on an SSD for speed. I know the desktop and the laptop that I, I 
bought recently both have an SSD and uh, internal hard drive. And the SSD yeah. is where the operating system is on. Yeah, I mean, I added an SSD to this laptop and then I put the existing hard drive, it was three quarters of a terabyte into a, uh, a like a CD cradle uh, thing and plugged it where the CD drive used to be or DVD drive. So I got both of them on here, but for the most part, I only use the stuff that's on the SSD. And if I'm saving anything archival, I'm going to put it on the NAS or put it on one of the, because the hard drive still has a copy of Win 7 on it, in case I want to boot up and play with that older version of Quicken that may not want to play on Windows 10. <clears throat> Although I probably should reboot on Windows 7 and see what new things have happened to it. Every once in a while, I get surprised when I boot up a Win 7 machine and, oh, we want to update all your Microsoft stuff, except for your operating system. Okay, do I trust you? <laughs> I know that Windows 10, there's a new thing that just came out. I don't have the knowledge base number. You can go research it, though. They have started to push out automatically without asking you the option to delete flash from your operating system. And for most people, that's really a good idea. For most people, it's a good idea. For me, no, because I need a flash entity to do things with. So I've maintained several older images and I have a couple of older machines that I intend on keeping on those releases so that I can uh, activate flash and use some of the alternative flash if those work as well. I wonder if using, I wonder if using WU show hide would block that uh, forced flash removal. I'm not sure. Um, you'd have to look carefully because it came in with a, a separate one and it was supposed to be voluntary, but then it got pushed as automatic and people automatically had it removed without any control of their own. They and had updates enabled. And no warning, and therefore you didn't know it was coming. You didn't know what the KB was. Right. It was just all of a sudden gone. So don't, I've suspended all of my updates for at least a week until they settle this out. Oh, I don't, always suspend mine for about two or three weeks anyway. Yeah. I, well, I'm about ready to suspend it for another week, just in case. And I also have my feature update fixed on 20H2. I have not. Uh, I have not tried to do the 20H2 trick yet. I'm still uh, very soundly entrenched on 2004 on several of my Win 10 machines. I thought, yeah. okay, we're just gonna keep it, park it here for a while, and let everyone test the other one out. Yeah. In other words, I, in my case, I have Pro, so I use the group policy. Yeah. Be a, by the way, be aware with Flash. It's not always Microsoft removing it. On one of my machines, the Flash updater popped up, said we're removing Flash since it's no longer supported, and did it on its own. The Adobe yeah. updater got gotcha. you. Right. Yeah. Yep. yeah. The Adobe updater, the Chrome updater, and now the OS. But the one oh, that the OS is. takes out the System 32 module that was needed. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> yeah. Uh, Chrome, uh, it's because the browser updates. Mm hmm but I'm, but I'm not sure there's a way to do much with the Adobe installer because uh, every time I found the Adobe updater running, I disable it. <laughs> but it turns itself back on a lot. I physically remove it. <laughs> and I have older versions of Adobe that are running, so it doesn't even prompt me for that. <laughs> there's there's a way you know fool me once shame on you fool me twice shame on me so once i get fooled twice then all of a sudden i said okay i'm gonna find your installer and, and rip it out by the roots <laughs> <laughs> with prejudice <laughs> as long as everything else works <laughs> well for the most part uh if it's stable and you don't need changes i mean Adobe is a love-hate relationship with Reader anyway, uh, yeah. because they always keep messing up and throwing in these modes that I could care less. When I want to click on a document, I'd prefer to open in read mode on the, win on the screen size that I choose. And it always seems to want to take a different tact. Oh, I think you need the signature signing app and you should be able to fix this on adobe.com. I said, heck no, <laughs> go in read mode, you stupid thing. 
I even went so far as to uh, rip out uh, Adobe DC and go back to like Adobe 11 on one of my machines. I got tired of arguing with it. Does Carl have his hand up? Good. You got to unmute though, Carl. Hit the space bar. There we go. Now you, you turned off your video, but you turned on the audio. Okay. <laughs> I got the mic going anyway. There you go. I, uh, a while back, you did a, a couple presentations on UMA. And I, my question is a couple are, uh, did you get the business machine or the uh, consumer model? And how much a month did it cost you? And how easy was it? Or or difficult to install? Uh, installation, what I did was I got the original UMA and I toyed with it with the free one for a bit. And then when I upgraded to go professional because then I had the automatic second line, I then did that and switched over one of my home phone te telephone numbers to the UMA line. So I got the personal, the Tello, um, I got the Tello at the time I picked up the Tello and then I immediately had a Lynx that came with that particular package that I picked up from Costco years ago. And then I also added HD2 handsets. So I went and purchased the HD2 handsets, but they're getting a little long in the tooth now. This is back in 2013. Some of them, the speakers are starting to get a little bit fuzzy and uh, they have a tendency to sometimes lock up. So I've gotten HD3 handsets to replace them with, but I haven't put them into service. And because of the way I ordered them, Uma has happened to send me two sets of three. <laughs> so I have a collection of HD3s that are waiting there. The difference between the HD2 and the HD3 is uh, HD3 is a little bit newer. It runs on AAA rechargeables, not AA rechargeables. So I don't know if that affects the life or not, or do they have some very exclusive technology to turn off the display while you're talking so you can't uh, use the battery up. But I, with any, the difference between a AAA rechargeable and a AA rechargeable is might be 2000 milliampere hours versus 600. So you're, you're, that's per cell. Okay, so you're definitely cutting down the capacity of the battery by using those. But um, I've had some issues with certain updates come through where I recently posed a question to them and I'm not sure if they sent me a diagnostic download for it or not. They may have done that. Um, if, I, if you have over 255 items in the block list, it was like items added after 255 stopped getting checked for being blocked, <laughs> which is a common error if, if you know about programming things. Well, things that stop checking at a particular a lot, a length usually due to the size of the counter being used to index into things. So that blocked your uh, Robo calls or some of them? Anyway, well, it can't, it doesn't do all, it doesn't do the ones that rotate through different phone numbers. So you can try and block every unused phone number. And the problem is, is the robo callers just don't use unassigned numbers. They're also using live numbers from other people as well. So uh, for a while, I was getting constant inundation from Bed Bath and Beyond. <laughs> And it wasn't them calling me. <laughs> that's, a, that's about a, block, a mile and a half away. It was spammers, you know, spoofers. And I'm just hoping that with our current uh, change of administration, that there may be some more enforcement of robocalls to the point where if you use a spoofed caller ID and you call my number, I can declare it a fraud. <laughs> okay, so prosecute for fraud. Yeah. Which would make sense. I mean, anytime somebody uses a false pro caller ID, and if there's any scheme to make any sort of money, there's money involved, there's fraud involved, that's the $10,000 per call fine. I'll take 9950 of it. Yeah, but uh, hopefully they also get uh, jail time too. Uh, I would think that something a little stronger, like, you know, the Procrustean bed. 
Did this uh, replace your landline? I have. I had two landlines. I went from two to one. I kept the old landline just in case for fax. Although occasionally I've tried fax with Uma and it seems to be working okay. Sometimes you have to use special dialing mechanisms to wait for the uh, return dial tone or the return fax to answer, or you got to give the Uma and or links a heads up that this is a fax line. So uh, there are some issues sometimes with faxes if you try and use UMA for fax, but if you're not using any fax or using a fax service, there's no problem at all replacing the landline with it. You automatically get your caller ID with it. Really? So, yeah. It's some of the caller IDs are also now triggering uh, a spam message popping up on your ID when, when the call comes in. If uh, it depends on how you have some of the settings, I have mine set to a custom setting. You can actually make it so you could put everybody in your address book that you ever want to receive a phone call from, and everybody else goes to hell. Yeah, except when the person you want to really hear from isn't in your address book, and then, then, then you're in trouble, right? Well, that's when I give them my cell phone for backup, and then they call my cell phone. But I, we have call filter from Verizon on those, and that sometimes does a little bit of a, a job, but I don't know if it's worth the additional fee. I think I may have explained to my, uh, about my problem with call filter in the past. I have one paid call filter and one free call filter. If you switch between them, you lose the numbers you've blocked in the other application. Got to re-enter them all again, which is a pain in the butt. So how much did this cost you a month with UMA versus the uh, landline? Uh, my landline, it's because I, so I effectively have two telephone lines with UMA. With two telephone lines with uh, AT&T, it was $70 a month. Going pushing 80 at the time I switched. Okay. Uh, I've switched one of those lines since to Pioneer and that's still a constant 37. And one day soon I'll transfer that second number over. The UMA cost, um, I have UMA Premier. So that gets renewed every year. And the going rate for that is about $140 for the whole year. So that's about 12 bucks a month. In addition, you have the FCC fee and taxes. That's about $7 a month. It's somewhere some six, $7 right around that range. So you're getting your two telephone lines for $19 a month instead of paying $80 a month. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. It's, and you can wire up your physical phone lines. You can put one phone line into the UMA. If you get the links, you can plug a second phone line into that. So if you had wired two line phones in your house, which I also do, um, that works too. Oh, super. Yeah, so if you had cordless decked phones, um, you could hook up UMA to a cordless deck phone and it would ring just like anything else and you'd have access and pretty much the same thing as having the HD2 or HD3. Except the HD2 and 3 do multiple line a little bit better. So I can pick up my HD2 when my wife is on a different HD2. Okay. If I press the off hook, it grabs me the second phone line automatically. Huh. If I want to join into her call and do like an old analog conference, I got to push some extra buttons to rejoin that. But anytime you're on one call or you're receiving one call and you pick up and do the dial tone, it automatically grabs the second line for you. Sounds good. So oh. it works, works for me. I've had it since uh, 2013, working fine. According to what it tells me, if I log on to the UMA website, it says I've saved about $4,000. <laughs> all you do is take that to the bank well the other thing is i can call anywhere in the u.s and canada and uh i've never been penalized for any long phone calls not mexico i'm not sure if mexico is included in that i'm pretty sure it isn't though i think it was u.s and canada how about international calls they charge you for that or something you can get charged for international calls too but if you have any, have any serious international calls, the, the answer for that has always been Skype. 
Right. Yeah, the person yeah. you want to call in the other country, get a U.S. Skype line, and you can always do Skype to Skype in the U.S. for free. Or yeah. FaceTime or other things like that. Yeah. Uh, what did you say? FaceTime. I don't use FaceTime. I know. We I don't do install that with... a lot of the. I don't install Facebook as an app, and I don't use FaceTime. Well, I don't I'm use Apple. The... I'm oh. talking on the iPhone because my brother-in-law has the iPhone and my cousin has an iPhone and that makes it really convenient and it's cheap. It doesn't cost the time. Yeah. As long as it's built in. I don't use iPhone. Yeah. I use Android. Yeah. So I know. Well, you, can, <laughs> you use... can you can do that on the Android side yeah, with, as well. With right. Duo. Yeah. Duo. Yeah. Duo a bunch on of the apps Android. That. By, by the way, uh, the, the bad, worst case I had on blocking was I had an accident and the adjusters from State Farm were trying to call me, but they couldn't get through because they blocked their caller IDs. Oh, so you had, my, yeah. I have yeah, to turn off yeah. anonymous caller ID blocking if I know a doctor is going to be calling yeah. me. So I actually had a call from my agent saying, the adjusters have been trying for two days to get through to you, but they can't get through to your number. In which case, I they usually said, I have an email, I have a cell phone. You can get a hold of me that way, and we'll we'll talk. That's usually what my, my wife does now. She has the doctor call her cell phone. But we try not to list the cell phones in too many places so that there's less robocalls on them. I Supposedly, if you go into all the databases and start excising your phone number out of them, it might possibly reduce the incidence at which somebody's trying to reach you like that. Uh, again, there, there are scammers that are looking for people, uh, people of age. How's that? Which that would be the new name for old people, people of age <laughs> that they want to take advantage of. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. So if they're going to try and take advantage of somebody, you know, I, I'd love to have the honeypot approach like, yeah, sure, dial into my machine and fix it. And meanwhile, I'm going to infect your machine with a virus you've never even seen before. <laughs> <laughs> there's there's a great evilness to what they the, the some of these guys do to seniors. My mother, after she passed and I was going through her stuff, wrote over 400 checks to charities because they had passed her name to each other, and they all kept calling her asking for money. Uh, so she'd be sent into another one, and that got her on more lists, which got her on more lists. Yeah. And I and I there were hundreds of letters she had in her effects from these charities that weren't real charities basically but that yeah. they just all once you'd given to one they were inter they were given the numbers and the information did she pay other. any lotteries off no no i mean she was just it, it would be a letter from some poor yeah. kid in el salvador that needed to be supported um and and then it would be some poor person somewhere else and it would just keep going and she went through checkbook after checkbook after checkbook, giving money to, to those people. It, it's, it's tough. And they, they can make it sound really good. Sure. I mean, I've proposed things where people have called me pretending to be a credit card company. You know, I, I, I take issue when somebody tells me they're from Discover, and I know you're not from Discover. <laughs> oh, the so, ones where they're going to get you a lower interest rate. Uh, yeah, right. whatever. They said, oh, I'm from Discover. Yes, you're not from Discover. But I wish I could give them a fake credit card number that immediately triggers the full effort of the fraud department of Discover to land on them with both feet like an eagle and start ripping flesh. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've started to use privacy.com, which lets you generate credit card numbers and it's nifty because it locks them to one company and you can set a maximum amount per month or a maximum amount forever. Um, Cause a lot of stuff these days wants to put you on auto renew to make it easier for you. Right. I don't want it easier for me because they renew at their full rate and you know, you can get it cheaper than their full rate. Well, that's the thing is they always have, they always want to charge you more than the full rate, I think. It's just like magazine for subscriptions that do that. But 
also there's all ones that I don't even remember using, you know, we can't use your credit card anymore because it's the expiration dates coming up. Like, Whoa, why are you even looking at that? Why do you still have that information? <laughs> yeah, no. And they've solved that in a way. The last few things I've seen have a disclaimer at the bottom saying that they have the right to update expiration dates. Well, they may have the right to update it, but I'm not going to tell them what the new number is if I don't want them to have it. And they, I had one they didn't even ask. They well, went to the credit card company and said, and evidently said, we've got the rights for, he gave us the okay, and they let them do it. Wow. I've I had would... that happen too so on, for several people that I have auto payment on, and I you know, I got a new credit card number and I was going through my list and calling people and I, I don't remember who it was, but they said, oh, we already have your new credit card number. Really? Yeah. How did you get that? I didn't give it to you. Yeah. Same thing. Uh-huh. Somebody's got your entire identity on the dark web. <laughs> hey, <laughs> I haven't had any problems yet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I know who's on the dark web. It's actually me. Ar har. <laughs> mm, there you go. There you go. <laughs> I got a question, Ed. Sure. On my new laptop, when I first come up, no application is running. You just got the desktop showing. Coming in from the right side, I get a lot of pop-ups. If you get any sort of pop-ups at all, I would definitely look and see what bloatware you got installed on that machine. <laughs> Is it, I, it, it comes in from the right? Is, is it like off screen to the right? Yeah. I, I try and resize your, your, I'm not sure if you've got a virtual monitor desktop thing where you're looking into a window of something much bigger, no, but see whether or not you have sized your window down smaller so it can't wrap off the screen and see if there's anything there. But if you got something that pops up automatically, uh, Two things I would do, look and see what's in your startup list. There are various programs that'll let you show you what's in your Windows startup. Yeah. And the other thing I always do whenever I get a new machine, the first thing I install is Microsoft um, Sys Internals. So I have Process Explorer that lets me go find things and try and find where they launched from and who their parent was. And then I could go search for them either in group policy or in one of the startup things or like use um i've even used ccleaner to look and see where these things start up from yeah windows 10 has notifications that use the toast style coming in from the right yeah. and uh, these are app notifications and they are controlled in settings through either notifications or apps and those are places in settings in windows 10. I'll take a look there and see if I can find something. So uh, you have to tell app by app which ones are not to show you notifications. Yeah. Or you can turn off all. What, you can what happens, off. you know, it starts up where they come in like a ton and then all of a sudden they stop. That is true. There are cached notifications or things, you know, that are in the, in the cloud. They're just waiting to gang up on you. My yeah. Android... My Android phone does that to me. Yeah, I, I there is a setting you can go into set, settings and turn them off. I'm at my app. I have only a couple things that pop up. Usually, it's like a Cronus says, "Oh, there finally is an update." You can go uh, ahead and apply I'm it. I'm not talking applications. Mm -hmm. They're just you know uh, news things and things like that. Well, Those you would... got. You got it hooked up to something else then along the way, because I don't have anything close to that on 2004. Are you using 20H2? 21 uh, no. H2? no, I'm not up to that yet. Okay. I What you might have are notifications from store apps, Windows store apps, because they have a news one and they have some others. Could be MSN. That or an RSS feed, one of the two. Yeah. Yeah, you can get you can quickly go to the notification manage page by using that little notification in the bottom right hand corner, clicking on it, and at the top of that it says manage notifications, and it takes you right to the settings screen on notifications, and it shows you about all of the apps and the most recent apps 
and maybe the most recent ones are the most obnoxious ones because those are the ones that most recently popped up and then start killing the most recent ones until they go away. That's what I do on my Android phone as I always go into apps and go show me who just interrupted me three minutes ago that I never want to have a notification voice anything on my phone. Ah, you're off, gone. <laughs> so if, if uh, Chrome wants to send me a notification, forget about it. Do it, do it visually, put a little dot on your icon. That's about it. all I wanna hear about. My wife likes to have notifications for every email. If I did that, my phone speaker would fall out of the case. <laughs> I, get, I get like 150 emails a day sometimes. So if I, it goes off for each one of those, in the middle of the night, I have to go over and turn off her phone, like mute it, like silence. <laughs> yeah. I have a weather app on my Android phone that every half hour, it does three notifications. And, and that's kind of ridiculous. That's the ridiculous. I even turned off some of the, uh, the uh, stolen child icon. <laughs> some of those apps, you know, I, I think, what the heck is going on? I, I can see a weather alert, but somebody got kidnapped in the other end of Illinois. Uh, that's not going to bother me. I mean, let it bother the other 10 million people that don't know how to turn it off. You know what I got? I got a reverse 911 call at 12:30 at night. Whoa. <laughs> and that was that was not a was, what dialed 911 on your machine? <laughs> no, it's a reverse it's a reverse 911 from the city police yeah. department. That's because and they they thought you called 911, right? No, reverse 911. That's a notification that there's an emergency somewhere. Right. Oh, okay. And what, so that, that's the same. That's okay. I know what you're. Uh, we what have was, a yeah. notification system in our village as well, not the police department, but the, the village will send out, usually yeah. it's emails. And if they knew your set, set phone number, they'd text you something as well. So, yeah, well, I, ours, I, mine's on a voice line. And I, so the phone rings. And uh, so I have to pick it up. And when I do pick it up, it turns out there's a, an elderly woman who wandered off in the middle of the night, somewhere a few blocks away. If she's knocking on my door, I'll let her in to warm up. <laughs> yeah, well, she was heading the other way. They don't send you a reverse 911 if the local donut shop runs out of donuts, do they? <laughs> <laughs> I think it, some of it the, depends what city. <laughs> I think the, the, the worst ones are the robocalls for the police organizations that come in. And when they come in, I, I, I you know, and I, you know, I'm waiting to see if they're going to start talking and then I'll go, hello. And then all of a sudden, ah, Edward, that's like my old pal, you know, and I know it's a robot. I've asked, are you a robot? <laughs> and they said, well, we are using a machine to help us call people. <laughs> I should put that on my uh, voicemail message when somebody calls. Just somebody, like, didn't somebody do a, a thing where they had their own AI that was answering, would answer those guys? Yeah, and driving create crazy. Conversations, yes. yeah. Except that's just a short, short putt for some of those. We keep going back and forth. If you want to see weird, look at the second link I put in chat. Okay. What's that for, Seth? Elf grin? Yeah. It, <laughs> what it does is it gener it's a random identity generator. And oh, that would be really good to answer my phone with. And if you look at the page that generates randomly when you click on it, mm -hmm. It's creating even a zodiac sign, a birthplace, a passport number, a driver's license in state, car, car license plate. I want one to generate a credit card that has a $10,000 outstanding balance so I can turn it loose to these guys and then let them go to, you know, searching for this. We can't access your card. <laughs> but, I, but I love it. Even generates favorite season, favorite comfort food. They don't send you any documents or anything, right? It's like no, it's a fake. fake it's a fake identity here. It's but not they these send... ideas, but but the the digits will pass an entry form. Stanford's got his hand up. 
Go ahead. Um, new question, new direction. Sure. <laughs> uh, first thing, I get got to get my hand down. Uh, <laughs> lower. No, it'll go away. Just give uh, it time. Um, I'm asking, is anybody here proficient at handbrake, using handbrake, and know the settings to use? I don't think anyone's ever proficient in handbrake because there are so many options that nobody has been able to try all possible ones. Well, okay. I, I guess I, I mean, I've hand used handbrake before to right. take a video and reprocess it so it's a lot smaller. Right. But have I done every possible thing with handbrake? You know, I, I look at all the options and I, there's no way I'm going to use all of these things. Has anyone else in the group used handbrake and know about the video settings? There was something that just came through on Camp Commando on making, taking your video file and making it smaller. Is that what you're trying to do? No, well, what I'm doing is I'm ripping DVDs and, um, and I want to know what there's, many different ways in which you can set up uh, how much compression or what kind of, um, it, do you want it at 1080p, 30 frames a second, high quality, super high quality, regular quality, that kind of stuff is what I'm asking about is those quality settings. Are you ripping I'm, from a DVD, um, a Blu-ray or from a regular a, DVD? A regular DVD. Format oh. Factory will do that, but I don't know well, what settings. I'm, I'm not, Jerry, I'm working on handbrake, okay? okay. Not looking for Format Factory. Yeah. Handbrake. The, the question is, you can never get actually more quality than the native medium supports. Okay. So with, I, I don't know how many DVDs actually are full 1080 out there. Any older ones are going to be less than that. Okay. So you may not be, all it's going to do is make a bigger file for you. You're not going to get any better quality. So I, wasn't there an option to do a test sample? Uh, I don't know about doing it. I didn't see I, anything. I thought there that. was something in one of these. I don't remember if it was handbrake, but I remember you could make a sample and then you could go try it and see whether or not it rips on your playback device or whatever. Well, it's the ripping I can do, and I don't mind the process, processing time. Um being longer or shorter, I just want to make sure that I'm not, uh, when I go and do it, am I doing too big of a file for a waste or am I doing the right size file? Because I read on one blog, if you will, it says, go ahead and do it at 1080p. Um, and then you could choose which one you want, like fast. And then a, another article said, don't even bother going that higher resolution because the DVDs are down in the 400s. So yeah, like at, at, at most like 720, that. as most 720 usually. Okay. I mean, yeah. 720 is a very nice compromise if you're going to save a lot of images where it's as, it's better than broadcast quality on SD. It's not, it may be as good as HD broadcast quality if they de res any of it or they're playing an old movie. But 720 is what like most of the old movies could, you know, actually be recorded at. And I would, I would go, I would make a couple, do some of those and then watch them and see, is it too grainy? No, it's fine. You know, can't yeah. tell the difference. I did, <clears throat> I did do that. I did three different options and I pulled them up on the screen and I couldn't, because you're not doing a side by side, you have to kind of remember where am I seeing pixelization and where am I not? And it, it's it, hard to I, do. I'll give you a hint on one. If they have any time where they show somebody's cell phone in the video, you can tell the difference between 720 and 1080 right there because you can read it in 1080 easily from across the room. But in 720, you got to get up close to the TV and freeze it to read what was on the screen. <laughs> okay. I mean, that's about the only thing that you're going to run. I mean, I've uh, downloaded stuff in H.264, which is even smaller than 720. But 720 is comfortable for me. Usually 1080 is a little oversized. I'm getting to, you know, about uh, 1.3 or 1.5 gigabyte size per hour if you're doing 1080. And if you're doing okay. 720, you may be under a gigabyte. What about using, um, instead of H.264, using H.265? 
I haven't tried to use too much in anything other than 264 because that seems to be compatible with my playback device, which is Roku. Okay. So if I'm my on my older Roku's, I used to have problems with uh, if it was doing if it was trying to transcode down to it uh, by with the NAS, and I did I haven't paid for the hardware uh, transcoding yet for Plex. Um, and for some of the other things. So yeah, you, you, you get one, you'll get, you lose some. <laughs> Doesn't Plex have transcoding built in or you got to do- you have the lifetime server, yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah you can have transcoding, but to get it, you have to have a, a license. If you're got doing it. the free, I mean, I, I recently upgraded to the server. So I have it built in now and I have less problems with some of the videos I've downloaded. Sometimes it's just the video was not uh, encoded properly before it was uploaded. Okay. So, I mean, I've done the same thing where I've done, you know, ripping of uh, DVDs and if I messed up with it or and tried to rush it, played with the wrong settings, it doesn't play so well. <laughs> I want to get it close to, closest to the target screen that I want. Okay. So now my playback device, I have... Uh, a 1080 30 frames per second uh, TV, which is my highest res in the house. I don't go for the 4K stuff yet. One of these days I may have to upgrade to it, but for right now, I don't need to see. Sometimes high, Sometimes the resolution the resolution can be too high. Yes, it can. Yes. And so even when you, the frame when you start rate. focusing on the actor's faces and all the imperfections that you didn't see in the lower resolution, that's too much. <laughs> and even the ones that are doing the scan rate of what is it 240 instead of one you know instead of like 120 that 240 is just way overkill right and you could see every flaw there is in the uh in when they shot it when they shot the video yeah you could identify the species of fly that was on mike pence's head yeah <laughs> <laughs> and tell whether it's male or female <laughs> Yeah, that's too much resolution. Yeah. If I'm just trying to watch something, though, and uh, you know, let's say I missed something and I want to download it or watch it, you know, and I'm watching it in any sort of the streaming apps, they're not necessarily playing it at 1080 either. OK, if you look at most of your Netflix and Amazon Prime and they're not playing at full 1080 all the time, sometimes it's less than that. Depends on what right. the original source was. Anyone, anyone else want to comment on Handbrake? I've used it a few times, but not enough to really comment. I'm putting a link in chat, though, um, of programs that let you det easily determine the resolution of stuff. And it gives the re fixed resolutions of DVDs and other stuff. Oh, nice. That's worth adding to my list. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's also a pretty simple way. Uh, if you're playing back a uh, DVD or any source on a TV, usually a TV will auto select whatever the right. native resolution of that medium is. And then you just figure out, uh, then you just look in your settings and see what the TV has set itself to. But sometimes when you're playing it through a streaming device, it's already transcoded it for you. Right. <laughs> yes. And also some uh, TVs will up convert. Yeah, and I know with Plex, you can go into Plex and do the properties and see what was originally recorded at and what what uh, you know, whether it had subtitles or who knows what other things are on it. If I recall correctly, DVDs are done at 720p and Blu-rays are 1080. Yes. Okay. Yeah, except don't forget there are 4K Blu-ray now. I've been checking them out of the library. Schomburg Library has a bunch of them now. And what do you see in there that you missed in the original 720? Depends on the video. On some of them, it's the it almost the image almost looks like 3D ish at at four at that 4K. What's weird though is they're releasing a lot of old stuff at 4K, and it's old stuff. It it as you said, you can't add what isn't there. <laughs> so they're they're bumping it up and putting it on these 4K Blu-ray. And the other thing they're doing is these animated movies at 4K Blu-ray. 
Oh, it's yeah, animated. Right. What are you getting by putting that at 4K? I... Nothing except using, wasting a lot of room. That They're trying to copy protect it, Sid, because when you try and copy a 4K, it's so big you can't have any place to put it. Pretty, pretty much. Pretty much. I mean, um, 4K Die Hard 2, what are you going to do? See the individual snowflakes? Well, what are they going to do with the 8K that's uh, coming out? I only want 8K for my security videos. <laughs> <laughs> and, the, and the large number of hard drives to store this stuff. And the up. large number of hard drives to store it. I want, when somebody comes <laughs> up, I want to be able to know I can print a passport photo for him. <laughs> yeah, the only thing that I, 4K and HK are used, I, are useful for is if you have games with fast action very fast movement. Well, then you got to have such a large machine that you better be running a back to the desktop that has, yep. a, you know, dual crossfire uh, video cards and a, a 240, 60 uh, hertz monitor that's, you know, 37 inches and wraps around you and you may as well just turn off life and live in reality and unreality. I have a nephew oh. who's like that. <laughs> My son-in-law and daughter get into a lot of that. They don't. I don't know if they have the curved monitors yet, but they had to both have. Uh, I think he does have a one of the new AMD fast processors. He just upgraded because it's not wasn't going fast enough. Thread ripper. Yeah. But, thread ripper. Uh, no, not a thread ripper. No? One of the the the, the high end oh. Ryzen. Ryzen. Okay. High-end Ryzen, yeah. So he's running a Ryzen chip in his machine now. Had to retire the old i7. It wasn't fast enough. Well, he's going to have to retire the Ryzen for a Threadripper. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't run enough stuff on my i7 now that it, it even gets busied. Uh, I mean, I start downloading something, and I can tell the difference between all my other machines and that uh, when I download Secure FTP on like even this machine, which is wireless, oh, I might get, you know, three or four megabytes per second or something. That thing's pulling in at 12 and 13. So did we get the handbrake question answered? Sort of. 720. <laughs> <laughs> Just say no if the 1080, unless it's Blu-ray. Thank you for your help. You're welcome. Although Handbrake is very interesting program. I do recommend it if you have to change the resolution of a video. That one seemed to be most stable of any of the ones I've used in the past. It also works with scripting too, I think. I almost want to try that, but I knew the minute I start getting into it, I'm going to, everything else is going to be suffering. I won't be doing any other work. <laughs> I won't be watching the grandkids. It'll be bad. <laughs> it'll be i like that it'll it'll be bad i just put another link in there uh, a web article on how to burn dvds with handbrake i don't know if that fits in with what you want to do well he was looking to rip them yeah i but to rip if i assume as part of the burning it helps with that now well. I'm, in this case i'm not burning i'm actually um uh I found a tutorial that walked me through on taking my original encrypted DVDs and be able to rip them and put them onto my hard drive onto my server, um, mm -hmm. which is, what I, you know, I've been trying to go diskless as much as possible. The old technique that I used to do was I first would decrypt them, but rip them to a hard drive and then burn a DVD and then I could rip them from there because I had a software that would do that automatically, but it had to be decrypted first. I just found that there's a, a certain DLL that you can load in and put it right into Handbrake and it'll do it all in one shot. Ooh, that's worth knowing about. Yeah, which, yeah, is, which yeah. is cool stuff. Um, I may have done all this, but the little recording icons on, up, it turned on up in the left-hand corner. So I'm not talking about it, but <laughs> I just may have I just may have done all this in the past. You just don't remember it. I know. Yeah, there you go. There <laughs> you go. I may have done it, or it may have been my evil twin brother. <laughs> <laughs> that, 
Now, see, that would be a good answer for how to put all of my Space 1999, the complete collection, onto my server. That is one of the hardest things there is to do, by the way. It is so it is incredibly difficult to rip a TV series off a DVD because of the way they do the multiple episodes on a disc. Yeah. Because of that, it's not like a standard taking a movie off. It it's trickier. It's anyway. much trickier, yes. Yeah. 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 Okay, other questions we got here. I see a hand up from Kathy. Oh, there's Kathy. <laughs> you thought you were going to get away no, with you, you're, you're, you keep moving around on the screen. I don't know how you keep changing squares. I, uh, I, anytime she uses the hand, anybody who uses the hand down in the uh, uh, reactions will automatically go up to the uh, beginning of the uh, uh, video list. Is that, uh, so, is that something in 5.5 .5 that just came down? Yes. Okay, yeah. that's yeah. why I upgraded to five five, so everything moved. Okay. If, uh, people will look at uh, uh, reactions. You'll see emoticons on top, and the bottom is a bar for putting your hand up, and it automatically puts you up at the top. APCG uses that very heavily. Okay, cool. All right, Kathy, you can ask your question now. Okay. Well, the talk about TVs triggered a question for me, so. I was wondering if any of you know what the lifespan of TVs are nowadays. And the TV that I have, I think I bought it in like 2009, 2010. It's a Samsung 40 inch flat screen. Um, it was right at the beginnings of when you could do apps on TV, um, the way, I mean, now I can do apps through Xfinity, but back then the way you did the apps was I had to get a Blu-ray player and I had to go through the Blu-ray player to get to Netflix. Right. And um, which I don't do, I haven't done that in a long time, but uh, but what I'm saying is that is how old the TV is. I think it's 2009, 2010. And just this past week, I'm noticing I'm having a lot of problems with the transmission of NBC, which I'm th I, I was thinking, okay, well, that's a problem with the cable transmission for NBC because I switched to other channels and they appear to pretty much be okay. I think one other channel had it a little bit. And I know we had some really got awful weather this week, but even today, NBC, <laughs> it was making crackling noises. So it got me to wondering, am I wrong in my assumption that it's just NBC or maybe I'm starting to have troubles with my TV? Is your TV connected wirelessly? Is it connected wirelessly? Yes. I have I have a cable running into the house that is hooked up. Uh, I don't know my wiring, but there's all sorts no, of- No, no, but you're doing NBC. Are you doing it through the Comcast cable box? Or are you doing it yes. through the TV directly connected as a wireless device? Um, it's going through the Comcast box. Well, okay. well um, I think it's going to the Comcast box. I think there's a wire running. Okay, so you don't have you don't have a Wi-Fi enabled TV, and it's doing some sort of app trying to do that. Because if the no. TV is on 2.4 gigahertz, that might be your answer. The other thing to do would be to. I'm pretty sure you can launch the NBC app on your laptop. Do you still get the same problem on that? Oh, oh, that's a good idea. I don't know. I'll have to try that. I know I have the NBC app on my iPad, so I'll give that a try. Yeah, just I always try on multiple media to see if it's one versus the other, because it could be whatever server that Comcast is using to rebroadcast NBC locally within their network. Because remember, they got a head end app that's trying to take the NBC feed and feed it to you. I know that if I have a Comcast channel that I'm watching, and uh, I know there are certain ways in diagnostic modes to go ahead and see 
am I seeing problem between the head end station and me? Am I getting pixelation because I'm getting lost packets there? If it shows no errors on that feed, then it uh, it's from the network. It's upstream from the head end. Okay, I'm not I'm not getting any pixelation at all. It's strictly the audio, and the the audio is giving a terrible like crackling type of sound. Well, typically what you're doing when you're doing, you're getting distorted audio, it's usually because of latency issues um, or um, jitter it's called in the, the packets are not being delivered to the decoder in the timely fashion. And so uh, if I go into settings on my Zoom call and I go into settings and I look at statistics, and I go on to the audio, I can actually real time see what the jitter is on this call. And I can also see if there's any problem with the video packet loss. Because with video, if the packet isn't delivered in time, it gets thrown away. With okay. audio, I have some choices depending on when I receive it. Do I put all of the audio into what's called a play out, playback buffer and let it play out in time, in which case a late packet uh, um, will turn into space, uh, a blank sound, or an early packet will be delayed until the playback buffer catches up with it. So some jitter can be removed by using a playback, but that automatically adds a delay between the audio input and the audio played out on your speaker. And sometimes if that's too big of a buffer, it's over you know 30 milliseconds, you can start to see people's I. <laughs> okay. Just that kind of stuff where the mouth moved and then the voice, then the audio came out. Okay. People don't like that usually. <laughs> I'll, I'll, you know, I usually sit a little bit farther away from the TV, so maybe I don't notice that. But that's a good idea. I will. I'll sit a little bit closer and I'll kind of watch for that. And I will try. Yeah, and, and try it with a different source and just see whether or not. And uh, you can always, I mean, with a laptop, sometimes you can plug into an HDMI connection, play it through the laptop. I've had problems where before my Roku was fixed and I still wanted to watch something, I'd plug in one of my HP laptops and pull it on the HP laptop and it played just fine because it's got a full i5 to decode it with. Mm -hmm. And in which case, if it was a too high a resolution for my uh, Roku to handle in transcode or is beyond the capabilities of the older Roku that I had, then the laptop was more than enough power to do it. But I did, I did go look at the other TV to see how the sound sounded on that. And it was fine on the other TV. So it was making me wonder, well, is it the TV, but why would it only be the one channel though? The TV oh. or the connection? That's a good question. Yeah. Also, uh, on that TV, uh, can you check the over the airwaves NBC? Well, you, can you hook up an antenna. I'll tell you, in this general area, uh, internet latency has been horrible the last several days. It uh, seems like this afternoon it just started clearing up and uh, getting back to more normal uh, uh, latencies. Uh, and I didn't happen to have any problems, but I'm not on the gigabit uh, kick right now. I only get 250 meg downloads. So, what what um, you said about the latency this week? Do you think that was weather? Yes. Really? Most well, anytime you have portion of the internet that's knocked out because some of the lines got pulled out, now it's rerouting stuff, you know, halfway around the earth. And if it ever goes through a satellite, you get horrendous delay. Okay. Especially if it's a geosynchronous over, uh, orbit uh, satellite, that's a quarter second up, quarter second down. Yeah, I had some latencies that were so bad uh, uh, that uh, uh, when I went to uh, some of my uh, uh, websites, that uh, it was like, uh, forget it, buddy, uh, because I can't uh, uh, get the signal in time and the app uh, uh, will time out and you're SOL. Right. Okay. That wouldn't, that wouldn't be a good thing. Actually, Kathy, just to say, the TV is designed to fail one week after the warranty runs out as a rule. <laughs> <laughs> Seems to be the, the norm on that, on that stuff. Uh, somebody mentioned using an over-the-air antenna. I think it was Bob. Yeah. And what I find fascinating is 
I get much better picture always from the over the air than from Comcast because the compression. Comcast compresses yeah. and they downgrade. Yeah. And yeah. because of that, you actually, if I flip to the antenna version, it's always a better resolution than and, the Comcast and it's, version. It's three to six seconds faster, too. Well, yeah. I, don't, I don't, I mean, you're watching it as you're watching it. What I found weird is, I think, Ed, you mentioned Roku, your Roku's. What I what boggled me is I didn't even know this. I went to over the air and they did an update to the Roku. I have the, it built into the TV, and all of a sudden I had 140 channels on over the air. And what they <laughs> what they've done now is they merged the Roku channels into the guide along with the real over the air channels. <laughs> so there's now 100 in the direct now in the list. There's 140 channels there on the over-the-air guide, well, which is really weird. I, and, one uh, other thing you can check, Kathy, is your Samsung TV. Was Samsung TV? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Check the different options for audio when you're listening to that channel. Sometimes if you've turned on surround sound or uh, any of the enhanced audio, usually you go into the audio menu and you go over to advanced and you go down and it has options like, okay, do you want to use enhanced surround, four-way, whatever, and try to turn off some of those and see whether or not any of the problem clears itself up. It might be the way it's trying to decode the surround sound, if it was a surround sound source or not. Well, okay. I'll yeah. give you another piece of advice now. One is uh, the uh, speakers on the, the flat panel TVs project out to the rear, and usually the audio quality sucks. I use a sound bar and I hear things crystal clear that uh, uh, previously I couldn't. The second thing is I hook up mine to a surge protector and I've got a cousin uh, uh, that lives in an area where uh, they have lots of jitter and uh, uh, brownouts, dropouts uh, uh, of power uh, such that uh, uh, generally their TV sets last uh, uh, anywhere between eight months and two years. And after that, they're dead as a Dorian. Wow. And all they had to do, and I, I keep telling them uh, uh, several times that, uh, uh, put a surge protector on the darn thing and it'll improve the lifespan of the TV. I, what is also uh, useful there in that situation is AVR, automatic voltage regulation. That yes. is found only on UPSs. Yes. Okay. But, uh, that's for the extreme cases, like uh, uh, my cousin. Right. Okay. I have lived in places like that too. Yeah. Especially places with lots of brownouts. Yeah. So I, I have left over from that an APC unit that does AVR. Well, I'm pretty sure that I do have the TV on a surge protector. And we do get, we used to get a lot of brownouts around here during the summertime. It not so much anymore. It's be, it has been better. But um, okay, you've you've all given me some real good ideas to and try. And you're wanting to know how long it lasts. It actually depends on how much the TV cost originally. <laughs> yeah. Because well, the cost of the TV originally, if you bought one like I did, that was 13 years ago. I have a Panasonic Viera 52 inch, which dates it right away because it's a plasma TV. Okay, there are some things that if I use Roku, the Roku volume control through HDMI does not work because that wasn't part of the spec then. <laughs> okay, so um, yes, yeah, older, lower, slower, but still has a great picture because plasma is all we did, always did, mm -hmm. right, right picture. Okay, now granted, it might not be like an OLED, but there's a penalty for the OLEDs because they have a shorter lifetime. So yep. you might have a really brilliant color, but is it gonna be that same color in five years? Well, if mm -hmm. you only paid 600 bucks for, the, for that 72 inch TV, maybe you can afford that another one then. Yep. I can't remember how much I paid for it, but it was, it was pretty expensive, but that technology at the at that year that I bought it, it was like 
it was really kind of new this whole thing where ooh they have you know you can <laughs> use the apps and go out to netflix so it was pretty expensive the same tv you know nowadays would probably be 400 bucks you, you know, know why it's 400 don't you no that's because they got a camera in it and the chinese are spying on you <laughs> yeah yeah no it, it's got it's gotten crazy i don't know if you get the treasure truck mailings from amazon today was a, a 60 inch samsung for 449 it fell off a truck i know that one <laughs> <laughs> what what the amazon treasure tre treasure trunk truck? truck treasure truck if you're in the place where it is at the time it wants to come through you win well and now it's though you don't do that anymore because of covid you just order it online and they send it like everything else. Uh, they, they're not running the truck right now. They're just running the, some of the deals. So you just, they have a limited number though. So does that qualify for Prime? Yeah, it does. It, 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 it and does, does it come with two people to bring it inside? No, <laughs> no, they're not, they're not doing that. By the way, Kathy, you know, as I think about it, I really don't think it's your speaker's um, I don't think it's likely the cable itself, because again, this is only on one station you're talking. Yeah. It's only on station, and I did check NBC on my other TV, and it was fine. But I didn't try. I didn't try the NBC app, though. That's a that's a good idea. Now, uh, which TV is considered your primary TV? And which is the second TV? This TV, the Samsung I've been talking about, is my primary TV. Okay. My secondary TV is a really, really, really old TV. Oh. It's not a flat screen, but you know it is um, cable ready. It's a CRT. <laughs> Well, the second one, the, the secondary may not be as sensitive to uh, these kinds of glitches as your primary. Mm, That's okay. why I mentioned your audio settings might have a lot to do with it. I know whenever I miss set any of the audio settings, um, sometimes you can't understand the understand the speech that people are using, and all of a sudden I'll flip. But I've noticed that occasionally after I flip channels, sometimes it momentarily sounds like surround sound on one of my other TVs until they until I switch back and then it's back to normal again. So I know that there are some things that can confuse the decoders that you're using from Comcast. I've had grainy sound when accidentally it got onto the SAP channel. Yeah, because <laughs> there is no SAP on that channel. <laughs> yeah, what you get is just the crummy sound from right. the regular from the main feed but it's much worse. Okay. Well, thank you all for your suggestions. I'll look into those. Okay. All right. So it looks like it's a quarter after eight. I think I should better get my uh, presentation started here. So let me see if I can pull it up. Let's do this. All right. And let's do view read mode. Good. How's that? Everyone can see it? Mm -hmm. Power options for the powerless. I thought this was more appropriate with the fact that half of Texas disappeared for a while. <laughs> Still gone. Still gone, yes. And, and their, their senator got caught on the way to Cancun. That's good. That couldn't happen any better. <laughs> okay, so power options. For starters, we normally take that power grid for granted and, until it's not there. Mm -hmm. um, typically, we the standard in the U.S. is we have a 230, 240 volt AC, 60 hertz, that comes in from the pole pig, and uh, it comes in on two hot wires and a neutral. That is split to 115 slash 120 volt AC circuits. The actual specification, as told to me by the uh, com the ComEd technician, was. They're looking for 120 volts at the transformer, which drops to 117 on one of your circuits in, at, the, at the breaker panel. So they're think, assuming a three volt loss down the cable that runs from the uh, pole pig to your house. 
most of the equipment that we're using today <clears throat> is designed for approximately 110 to 125 volt AC range, which is 117 roughly plus or minus 10%. Although there is some equipment, if it's designed to work worldwide, will typically be rated on the side to run from 100 volts AC to 240 volts AC. And it will also say 50 slash 60 hertz. A lot of the uh, foreign countries are 50 hertz. Why is it 50? Because it's a little easier on the power plants to deliver that amount of power to more people. <clears throat> on the 100 volt AC, that's strictly Japan, I believe. Okay, so power options when power isn't there. Um, the advertised availability for a residential user with your power connection is only three nines. It's either 0.999 as a fraction or 99.9%. So that amounts to 526 minutes per year of outage, <clears throat> which is normal, considered normal for your power set, uh, conditions. And per month, that would be 43 minutes a month. So on one average, you might have one 44 minute outage a month or an 88 minute every other month, or you might have 10 or 10 four minute outages in a month. Could have either one of those ways. However, about outages in the US, 99% of them are six seconds or less. And not all power grids are created equal. Um, some of the grids are inherently more reliable than others. Uh, we all know that there's areas that are more sensitive to nature-related outages. Um, Oklahoma, for example, for tornadoes and uh, the uh, hurricanes that hit Texas and, and Florida and tropical areas. Uh, ice storms can cause problems, especially when there's a lot of above ground uh, poles and uh, they don't take a proactive approach to pruning trees that can fall on power lines. I was looking at some of the power lines that got knocked down by um, recent uh, damage by trees falling over on it. It would not happen in ComEd territory because you can see how they prune any tree that goes near a power line so that it looks like it's a bonsai bush. <laughs> yeah. um, larger grids can transfer the power to where it's needed most in larger transmission networks. That's why. The, for the most part, a lot of the U.S. is on either the, the east grid or the west grid. And Texas happens to be a special case that I wasn't even aware of until they started showing me like, oh, they got their own one down there? How, yeah, how does that they have work? Their own. Yeah, they have their own. <laughs> and I guess it doesn't work that well either. <laughs> well, they don't have to follow, uh, by having their own, they don't have to uh, follow uh, federal regulations that everybody else does. True. And they got burned for it too. <laughs> <laughs> They deserved it. Yeah. Well, maybe they'll change their mind. Yeah, but, they're regulated by FERC. Yeah. Now, they do regulate your voltage somewhat to the individual residences by switching in and out capacitor banks to adjust the voltage up or down, depending on the demand. Because I've noticed exactly when all of a sudden my lights flicker, and I go check my voltage monitor, and I said, yeah, it just went up. They must have switched in a capacitor bank. Or at five o'clock at night, all of a sudden the lights blink and go a little bit dimmer. And I said, yep, they just switched them out again. Because typically the load on the, uh, the grid is mostly inductive. And by switching a capacitor bank in, it changes the phase relationship of current and voltage so that the voltage jumps up a little bit. So what can you do to protect yourself in these outages? <clears throat> Well, you can protect with UPS systems to keep certain critical things, and we've already talked about that. But when you have larger draw equipment, you're gonna need a plan and a more sizable investment, but you can break it down into these kinds of areas. We have fixed standby generators, which automatically switch in as soon as the power loss, and this usually covers your entire house. And it's typically either natural gas, propane, or diesel. You can have, it depends on what you have available and then you purchase what you have available. In the places that don't have natural gas, you have to either choose propane or diesel. Then you have to have a big propane bottle out in the yard or you gotta have a diesel uh, um, container outside that you have to worry about leaking. Uh, portable or semi-portable generators, which could be multi-fuel powered. Some are made, I saw one over at the shelf at Costco. It has 
gasoline, propane, or natural gas. Hmm. You won't find one that also has diesel. But then I read up on it and I had a surprise about that particular one. Inverter generators. These are a special kind of generator that instead internally generates DC current which then powers an inverter to create a very stable AC current. And it is more reliable when uh, loads are changed on the inverter generator so that the voltage doesn't change and it doesn't confuse sensitive electronic equipment. Um, you can talk about battery systems, power wall and such that uh, can be installed and either powered off the grid or powered off of some other uh, mechanism, either wind or solar. And um, then you have solar and wind. I mean, I just mentioned wind here. I'm not going to discuss it more than that because you only get power when the wind blows. But if you've got a turbine in your yard and you don't worry about killing birds, well, you have a possibility. Thick standby generators are typically designed to power an entire facility or at least the critical systems within the facility that would cover your light. Hold on, just moved here, good light, heat, cool, water, et cetera. The cost for a typical unit for a homeowner is in the three to 5K range, which just covers your average size house and has a transfer switch. Your installation and electrician costs are extra. The systems are not usually designed to switch immediately, but they have a delay, either six seconds or a minute or two minutes. This is to keep it from bouncing back and forth when, when you, we have one of those six second outages. So it is going to blink the lights, power is going to go down, come up, and it's going to lose everything in your cable box for the channel guide. <laughs> um, you do need an electrician to install a transfer switch, which then bulk switches your circuits from the power line to the generator power source. And then when the thing comes off, uh, when it goes back into utility power, it usually causes an interruption as well. Although there are some switches that can do a make before break, but those are more rare. Large diesel generators in the 20 to 100 kilowatt or bigger are used in commercial facilities, which have fuel tanks that get filled by tank trucks. So they have their diesel fuel and they periodically have to run these things once a month to test them. Even the, the average ones in, in your home, they will fire up every month just to test themselves. There is a lifetime to these generators, however. It's about 15,000 hours. So there are also peaker power plants that run a natural gas, which are used by the utilities to supplement utility power uh, when exceptionally high power draws are needed. They are nowhere as efficient as the other methods of generating electricity, but when you need power quickly, this might be the thing you, you had thrown in this isn't for you, but it's for your utility you might have this thing as an option. Portable power units. These are typically consumer grade, but you can get larger ones that are trailerable. The typical fuel is gasoline, but some can support either dual or tri-fuel options, which include propane and gas and propane and gas, propane and natural gas. But it's not free. On gasoline, you can get 9,400 starting watts, 7,500 continuous. But running on propane, you automatically go down to 8450. So you lose 1,000 watts almost and, and 6750 continuous. And you're losing 800 there. And natural gas, you further derate down to 6900 and 5500. Same generator, three different powers. Ooh. Why? Because there's less energy in the other fuels. Gasoline's got a lot of energy per cubic uh, unit. Ooh. And natural gas, the natural gas supply is kind of convenient because it's got a downtime that's three nines better than the electricity. Now, they can have planned outages where they said, I'm sorry, we got to change your meter. So you're going to have a planned outage. But unplanned outages are pretty rare with the natural gas. I don't know if they suffered from natural gas outages in Texas, though, because the equipment has to run on some sort of electricity. Uh, typical portable units usually range from about one kilowatt to nine. You can get some larger ones, but then they're, not, they're semi portable. <laughs> you need two men and a dog to move them. The smaller units, the advantage of having a smaller unit versus a larger unit is they usually run a lot longer between refueling. 
Some of these, you may have a four gallon tank, five gallon tank, or maybe even ten, eight gallons. That's a lot of gas to put into these things. If you're thinking about pouring gas, that's, you know, a five gallon <laughs> tank and a half. So um, you, and how long will they run? Uh, I have a three and a half kilowatt unit that has an idle control. So that when it uses less than 20 watts, let's say the refrigerator turned off, the sump pump's not running and I don't need to run the furnace, and it's less than 20 watts being used, it'll go down to an idle. And it's run between 12 and 18 hours between fills when I did that. And that happened right after I bought the uh, unit back in 98, we had an 18 hour outage in the middle of winter and it was 10 degrees. Okay, generators vary in speed with no loads applied that, that can also change the frequency and voltage of the generator. This can also generate harmonics, which are generated at multiples of the main frequency, which results in a distortion of the AC waveform. And the name for this is called THD, total harmonic distortion. So your average run of the mill generator is about 9%. Um, and now this one particular generator that I was looking at, that had the tri full fuel over at Costco. One of the negative comments was, he said that this thing produced THD at 20%, which made it Perfect. unusable with his electronics. And I think if this is the one I remember reading about, this had a rotating field instead of a rotating stator. There's two different kinds of, of uh, generators that you can, can deal with. You can use a rotating stator, which has slip rings for AC generation, has commutators for DC generation, and the field remains outside of the stator and, and stays stable, stays stationary. That's your typical generator. Now, if you can spin the field inside, and the field is either a magnetic, you know, permanent magnets or something inside of it, and the the commutators of the, the portion of the uh, is electronic outside. So your, your stator is fixed and your field is moving. Uh, it can be done that way. Uh, and it would, would, there's, there's no metal to metal contact in some place because it's all electronic. So it should be stable, but this is the one that generated the higher total harmonic distortion. Hmm. A way to get around this is to use an inverter generator. Inverter generator, it's usually a DC generator. It can be an AC generator or a three-phase generator that's rectified and filtered, and then it's converted to DC and, and then it's re-inverted back to generate AC. So they're using a bank of power MOSFETs to do this, and it generates an AC signal that's indistinguishable from what's coming out of the wall now. And it is not affected as much by load because it's got this step where it's filtering it and maybe even have the capacitor bank in it as well. Uh, it does come at a premium. This doubles or triples the price of the cost of the generator for the same wattage. And you don't usually see this in very larger, large generators. So you might use this for some uh, other type of applications where you're just trying to power servers of some sort. There's an option for the battery or power wall. I've seen these advertised in more than one time uh, where they used to talk about taking old um, electric car batteries and recycling them into what's called power walls or using them at uh, locations within the grid to help offset uh, power needs. So they would have a whole bunch of these batteries installed in a warehouse and this would be powered with an automatic inverter and when the power line would sag, this thing would automatically supply electricity to fill in the voids. And you could use this in locations that had a uh, uh, like minimal power lines going into the, the, the city and a small town or something. And then this would help um, handle the intermittent loads when an air conditioner turns on or big source powers used, and it would help fill in the before the line could catch up with it. Mm -hmm. um, so the power walls themselves, depending on the units, you can usually get enough out of them to power 10 to 12 hours or 12 to 15 hours with your full 10 kilowatt use before you've drained the batteries. Now your power walls can be powered one, one of two ways. 
They can be plugged into the grid. Okay, let's go. You know, they can be plugged into the grid and <clears throat> um, you can store from the grid and then send it back to the grid at a time where electricity is more expensive and use it to offset the cost of your electricity. <laughs> or you can actually use it to um, hooked up to like a solar or wind system where when the power source is available, you can store it into the batteries and use it when that power source is not available. Solar, a lot of people are talking about putting solar up there. <clears throat> a lot of them are just installing a system where they put the solar batteries on the top of the roof and then it's fed back into the grid. So if the grid is up and your solar is there, it's gonna make your meter run backward if you're not using that much power. Or if you need that much power, you'll, it'll go to you instead of pulling it from the grid. But the key is the grid has to be there for it to work. If the grid goes down, so does your solar power. It goes nowhere. <laughs> okay, because the inverters will snap off if they don't see the sink source available from the power line. Now there are some inverters that will continue to run like you can put a special inverter off of a solar bank and then run two kilowatts off of it without having the grid involved. So you, I, I don't remember the name, but I saw there, there's only a few of those that do that. But there was one that was out there that was the one to get if you wanted to do this. If you draw too much power from it, it's going to shut down. If there's not enough power coming into the solar panel, it's going to shut down. Now, the way you average a lot of that out is the solar panel is, in, is uh, connected with a battery like one of the power walls or some other large storage device, either 36 car batteries or <laughs> something like a power wall with lithium batteries, which are much smaller and more energy efficient. But if you use solar to charge the batteries and then run off of that, that's almost like the off-grid approach. So... If you watch these these things where, you know, I built this home in Alaska and I'm, there, I'm, I'm 300 miles away from the closest electrical source. Well, then you got to deal with the off the grid option where you have the solar panels charge batteries and the batteries run your equipment inside the house. So you usually don't have a lot of power items in these kinds of situations. They're usually designed extremely efficiently and all the lights are LED, there's no incandescent. Um, you don't have any electric stoves or anything else that is major power hogs. Yeah, everything is either gas or propane powered in those type of cases. And uh, maybe it runs your refrigerator. And that's a good use. A refrigerator could be a good use for a solar battery. <laughs> Some really complex systems can charge the battery and then actually send excess power to the grid if the batteries are already charged. They don't usually charge the batteries and then discharge the batteries into the grid unless there's a very steep cost between morning and night and you can make money on the deal. Um, the power generated is not is very clean but it's not inexhaustible. If a shadow goes in front of that grid and you're using relying on the power coming out of the grid, it's going to have to pull it from the other source. And you can't exceed the power available. At some times of the year, you're going to get less energy because of the angle of the sun than you are in the middle of the uh, summer. All right, so I have a couple caveats to operating stuff on a generator. Uh, the THD of a generator can affect sensitive electronics, particularly LED TVs and desktop computer monitors. Some monitors are real sensitive to running on it. So if you're going to be doing anything when you're lost power, you're not going to be doing it on a desktop, laptop, uh, desktop monitor. Uh, you're going to be doing it on a laptop. So laptops are much better at handling the, uh, the issue because they have power supplies that go that rated for that furl 100 to 240 volts AC. And it's sort of like the way the inverter does. They break it down to DC and then they reconvert it back to what the laptop wants to see. And that's how it powers the laptop. Now your desktop is a different animal. There's a desktop 300 watt power supply. And you noticed on this one, 
there is a switch there. That switch switches between 110 or 230. That means this one can't really handle a lot of different options in terms of variances of the power. That will probably have problems. Here's another one, a little bit smaller, but it's still 300 watts, no switch. If it doesn't switch and it can go from 100 to 240, that would handle a generator powered power supply much better, just like the laptops would. And if they also give you some figures, they have a thing called starting wattage and uh, continuous wattage. Starting wattage is what the maximum draw can be before the generator is probably going to stumble because you're reaching the horsepower of the, um, the engine that's driving it. So it's not going to be able to turn it any more, any faster, supply any more power than what the generator is being turned with by the gasoline or propane or whatever engine. So uh, starting wattage is got to be taken into account with anything with a motor. Uh, almost all motors that are not slow start or small, uh, soft start um, will require an inrush surge of power to start the compressor or they, to start the, uh, the motor. And that can draw anywhere up to four times as much power. Sometimes it's 10 times. I know that Sometimes when your main air conditioner kicks on, you hear a, a thunk or something, or maybe you'll hear a clack of the wires. There may be so much power going through that, tra that compressor turning on with the surge that the wires in the conduit will rattle. <laughs> the magnetic effect of the wires will actually move them. I've heard them clank inside of the conduit, especially when my starter cap on the uh, compressor and the AC was starting to go. Um, but you need to then keep an uh, amount of what you're plugging into this. And remember, your generator better be enough to handle that starting surge. So if you're trying to run your furnace, gas furnace, it's got a blower in it. And that blower draws about, oh, maybe about 1,000 watts, pretty close. On low setting, it's maybe about anywhere from 300 to 600. On high, it's about 1,000 watts. So all by its lonesome, it's drawing about eight amps. When that thing first starts to turn, it needs more. <laughs> okay, so it's going to draw, it may draw as high, high as 1600. Fortunately, it's not turning, doing that at the same time that it's trying to do the igniter because the igniter glow bar may draw 10 amps all by itself mm -hmm. on a auto ignite gas furnace. So you can run a furnace on a three and a half kilowatt generator if you had it wired up. So you usually, if you don't have a transfer switch and you want to be able to run your furnace in the middle of winter and you have a generator, he could wire in a pigtail so that you could plug in a connection to your power strip and run it to your generator and then be able to run the furnace uh, if you had no power. Usually you have a switch on the side of the furnace for for uh, use for uh, when they want to maintain it and they want to turn the furnace off. That's a great place where you would put that in there. Okay, additional caveats. One thing you don't want to use is a voltage suppressor outlet strip when using a generator. And why? <laughs> well, if the voltage surges when you have something like a sump pump or a refrigerator kicks in and turns off, the voltage may surge when that item turns off. And when the voltage surges and goes over 130 volts, that triggers the thyristors in the surge strip to fire. They short out the power connection at that point in time to try and protect the equipment that's connected to it. Well, <coughs> that's not a good thing with a generator because the generator might be capable of supplying more power than your power strip can handle. Power strips have been known to burst into flames that have been used with surge of suppressors. At the very least, it may damage the surge uh, protector so it's no longer useful. What you would normally use is a relocatable power tap. 
and that is a special designation on the side of it. You'll notice there are no circuit breakers on it. There may be a power switch, but there is no circuit breakers and no surge protectors. So if you're going to use them with a generator to power, make sure you use the right one. You might be able to get away with a surge protector, but I would check to make sure they don't get warm and smoky. <laughs> All right, and that is my presentation. Thank you. Now you're all experts. Go out and install the systems out there in Texas. <laughs> well, they need all the help they can get. Mm -hmm. Now I have, like I said, I have an old Coleman Vantage 1998 vintage generator, and it still starts on the first or second full. There are secrets to keeping a generator in good working order. Secret number one that I will pass on to you. Always turn off the fuel shutoff and run all the gas out of the carburetor after you've used it. Drain all of the gas out of the gas tank and use it in your lawnmower or somewhere else. Don't leave it in the gas tank. Old gas will kill your carburetors, sure as shooting. Uh, other thing to do, after you've broken in the generator with its first 20 or 30 hours, Take out all the oil, throw it away, put in mobile one. You'll never have to worry about your generator failing because of low oil or anything else after that. Break in, yes. After break in, fine, put in a synthetic oil and it'll run forever on that. You can change it every 200 hours if you think you need to, but with synthetic oil, there's nothing to break down. And that's why I have a generator that's still alive after that many years. <laughs> Very cool information. Yep. Very cool. Are you going to put the slides up? I will send them out right now. How's that? All righty. Let's see. My computer. Uh, yeah, Is gonna... there a giant hamster wheel for my German Shepherd to generate power with? I don't think he can generate enough power to do that, unfortunately, because... The human body, when you remember those bikes that you used to run on at the Museum of Science and Industry that you could see how much power you could try and generate, <laughs> you could barely make one eighth of a horsepower. <laughs> and that was pedaling like crazy. <laughs> what if it was Sid and the dog on the wheel? Well, it depends on whether the dog is chasing Sid. <laughs> Like uh, Sid had a Frankfurter in his hand and the dog wanted it. <laughs> yeah, if I had a T-R-E-A-T -E anywhere on me, she would definitely, and you notice how I won't even say the word out loud. because She's, she's going to learn near, how to spell. <laughs> she's, near, she's nearby, so I'm certainly not saying the word out loud. But <laughs> I was, I thought of that because I was, when I was in Alaska, I visited the Husky Hideaway, Jeff King's facility. Okay. Uh, he's done a lot of Iditarod, and he had this giant wheel for exercising these dogs in, and they would run out at full speed in this giant wheel. Well, I thought about doing that with one of the exercise machines, like, could I charge my phone with it, okay? And realistically, you're not generating enough power to, you might be able to turn a bike generator, but even a bike generator does you can feel a load when you used used to use those things to to charge the uh, and run a light? You could feel that operating on your uh, on your bike if you had it switched on. So, yeah, you could try it, but I don't think you're going to get too far with it. I also thought of other alternative uh, methods of turning a generator, like uh, heat engines. Um, maybe a possibility, but to get a heat engine large enough to turn a generator and then have it geared up so it would spin the generator at speed, you might get a fraction horsepower out of something the size of my kitchen table. <laughs> I mean, but that's always an interesting, you know, pot. Any, anytime you have a source of you know, warm versus cold, and if you have a well and you can pump water, you definitely have a source of cold, so... That's one that you might be able to generate. I don't know, would you generate enough heat difference between the two on a hot day that you could run the pump to the well? Probably not. 
But I do know they have thermoelectric generators where you're located near heat uh, sources, and they can pump, they can power uh, low pressure uh, turbines. Most most of Iceland is run geothermal. Yeah, they have they have those massive pipes. <laughs> yeah, you see running around. I, yeah. But if you were to have like a small uh, stream that flowed nearby and you wanted to run a water turbine, that's conceivable as long as you, you don't get too much um, debris that would flow up the tube, but you would use what's called a water ram. A water ram is a long pipe at a, at, a, at, a, at a shallow angle where the water is coming in and goes up the incline. So you can actually pump water uphill just because the rest of the water is pushing behind it. And actually, once you have it, a certain height now it can fall down again and it can generate power because you have that energy that sounds a lot like one of the rides at great america one of the logan, logan's run where it goes uphill before the drop uh -huh. mm -hmm. any other questions well you can you can generate electricity or power with a letdown because i i designed a gas uh system where we we were dropping steam from 600 to 250 or 150 mm -hmm. and it ran a 2000 horsepower motor for a compressor right but you but how much energy went into making the steam now if you got a lot full of wood and you can burn it all yeah you can get a lot of energy that way oh yeah well this was in a refinery yeah <laughs> you're sitting <laughs> on top of a fuel source right <laughs> that's the same place where they also can get pump gas into your car at 72 cents a gallon for high test. Yeah. <laughs> well, now in the South, you know, a lot of the houses are heated by heat pumps. Well, so, heat pumps and electric furnaces and right. they have no insulation in the floor. <laughs> and their idea of a water pipe is something that runs under the floor. Well, a lot of the houses, when I lived down there, the older houses were built up on stilts or, or pillars. Mm -hmm. the water pipes are under the house. And I have no problem on stilts. So I would insulate the crap out of them if I, I had one. <laughs> well, the, the newer houses are built on a slab and all your water pipes run to the ceiling. That's oh. what happens. They all freeze up. Yeah, I was watching a lot of houses that are damaged by frozen yep. pipes. Yep. Oh, yes. Yeah, people <laughs> didn't have enough sense to go turn off their uh, uh, water main uh, uh, at the uh, meter and uh, uh, open up a spigot uh, at the lowest point to uh, uh, drain the lines. Yeah, would have made sense. If they have, if they have the wherewithal to do it, they might not have the key to turn off the water either, so. Well, the first winter I, I lived down there on the Gulf Coast, I lived in a, a garage apartment and our, our, our landlord told us to run the water. So I turned all the faucets on in the, in the apartment and it all came out in the bathtub because that was the, <laughs> it's all the higher it could get. <laughs> and the problem was everybody was running the trickle in the water to the point that the power, the water company had a problem. And that happened here down in Texas just this time. Yeah. The utility co company couldn't keep up with it. Yeah. I, I usually don't have to worry about water. I pump it out of the ground myself. <laughs> <laughs> and I've had to run the water pump back when we had the power outage for 18 hours my daughter thought she had to go to school so i here i am with no power and i'm trying to run her shower for her so she's got a flashlight in there water heater doesn't need any power i just needs water so i pigtailed a cheater cord into the 220 circuit across this the relay and uh flew the breaker switch so i didn't run it through the back rest of the house and uh ran the well pump, three quarter horse well pump that's down about 170 feet and was able to supply her with water all that she needed. <laughs> but I didn't try and run that at the same time I was running the furnace. So <laughs> I toggled between the furnace, the well pump and the sump pumps because I you should still get groundwater around here and I can't use that for bathing. <laughs> <laughs> and I had like a refrigerator and a freezer on it and I found that sometimes with the power outages, what I would do is I would <clears throat> plug in the TV in the cable box and watch TV while I'm waiting for ComEd to turn the power back on and have the line go downstairs to run the sump pump when it needed to. 
Well, we had we had a power outage here today in my house. Last oh, about a half hour. Wow. See, that, like it adds up. A lot of places, you know, it, it may be momentary. In your case, it might have been ice or something or uh, inclement. Sometimes uh, somebody takes out a power pole <laughs> using it was, it was, their car at the same time. It was pretty wide. And, and my neighbor, they've got a, a, a gas generator. Mm -hmm. She came over here and their, their generator didn't start up. I actually have two generators. <clears throat> the first one I had, I found in the field when I first moved into the uh, facility here years ago. And I used to use it and it would run for 20 minutes to half an hour and then it would conk out, had too much piston slack. And so it overheat and it would shut down. So I was gonna rebuild it. And then I just decided here's an idle control generator available at Menards and this was, like I said, $1998. I still remember. I paid almost 700 bucks for that guy. And it's paid for itself way over the number of times I've needed to use it. Well, the neighbors have this power, you know, this generator. It starts up every Saturday and runs for an hour. Yeah. So, but, it, uh, it does every Saturday? That's every Saturday. Every Usually Saturday. they only need to do it once a month. No, it's every week. Okay. Because yep. Generac will sell you a generator. Um, and it'll cost typically right now, I think a 12 KW is about five grand, 49.99 installation extra. Right. <laughs> so you can, you can get these bundle. things. Oh, and it's Wi-Fi connected. So you can see when it's running, if your <laughs> Wi-Fi is powered up. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, and it's natural gas. So, you know, you, you would power it with natural gas and, as long as you have a pad, you can put it on and uh, it's not too far away from the power panel and they can run the cable to it, transfer switch inside, <clears throat> you're good to go. But if you try and uh, don't size it properly, you may find out that, oh, I can't run the air conditioner. Either you need to have your, your house zoned with smaller uh, furnaces and air conditioners so that you only run one at a time when you're on the transfer switch and that would you could get away with but you know 10 kilowatt that's that's probably more than i ever use in a day actually so i mean i i look at my power usage i, I get those little what is it the comed efficiency of reports and I, i'm looking at this thing and said okay here you are here's your efficient neighbors here you are and i'm right next to the efficient neighbors i like and the difference between my spending in a year versus my efficient neighbors is ten dollars. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I just think, did you read this before you sent this to me? <laughs> Why did you just put me in the efficient neighbors category and says, "Great, you're doing good. Thanks." <laughs> no, you might save ten dollars by being more efficient. Turn off that light bulb instead of running Zoom. <laughs> when my power went out, I, I immediately called ComEd, and I was on the line, and they uh, they checked. Uh, actually check my meter and said yeah you're not getting power so yeah they, they can check now directly mm -hmm. to your, your unit oh yeah they they get informed by your unit transmits to their system every 30 minutes why is it every 30 minutes anybody know because it's not every 20 minutes no because if they did it any faster they don't have enough bandwidth to handle all the meters Hmm. That's why it's every 30 minutes. And it's summarized by the uh, half hour. If you go on to your web, go into your comment account, you can actually see your entire power usage profile by half hour increments yep. and, and go and analyze all of that information. So is it a random tick ad for different people? Otherwise, everybody would be at the same time half hour boundary. No, they, they time to these ones. And the, the thing is, is it captures the information, but then it waits to send it. Yeah, it's, it's stored in the meter. Yeah, stored in the meter. And then they're, they're pulled and they're sent. It, it can actually send it either directly to the receiver unit if you're close enough, or it will send it to your neighbor's meter and keep on going until it gets to the, the, the unit. Because they can do peer-to-peer -peer sending, sort of like a built-in mesh network. It's my, my neighbor doesn't like me, so I would be afraid if it's sent to her 
she'd reject it and say, I no, wouldn't, I'm not. I wouldn't put any animals next to the meter because it does have a pretty high power capability there. <clears throat> I think it's almost, uh, it's between, uh, I think it may be 400 milliwatts, but it's still a 2.4 gigahertz, at least on the one that's by me. I know they could use 900 if they want. Um, now the gas people, they have a different way of doing theirs. Theirs has a battery in it because they don't have any electricity. It's a 10 year battery and they drive through the neighborhood and then they pull the individual gas meters to get an answer. They do that with water and chamber as well. Yeah, same concept and on and, and, uh, and water meters, if you have to pay for city water. Cool. Pretty soon they'll do it for your well and make you pay a well usage fee. I just as long as they don't have to pay, I don't have to pay extra for my septic field. I'm already get that pumped out, you know, a couple times a year, right? <laughs> Once a year. Cool. All right. I'm going to have to leave you guys soon because it's coming yeah. up on the witching hour and I have to take grandchildren home. <laughs> So thank you very much. Any ideas for next month's presentations? Suggestions? Survival in Texas? No, probably. <laughs> <laughs> Armadillo stew? <laughs> <laughs> they were running out of places to look for wood to burn. Yeah, there was a story of this family. They were burning the kids' blocks. 